Turn with me to uh, Revelation 15. Revelation 15 is really short. We'll go through this rather quickly. It's pretty much an introduction to the last seven judgments of God, the seven bold judgments that goes through chapter 16. But um, just because I haven't been here the last couple of weeks, I want to thank Jesse and then uh, my son-in-law John filling in the last couple Sundays. And um, thank you guys for doing such a great job. And anyway, so the chronological order of the book of Revelation real quickly. Revelation chapter 1, verse 19. This is where uh, Jesus tells the Apostle John, this is the outline for the book of Revelation. Jesus says, write the things which you have seen. Well, that is chapter 1. Past tense, what you've seen, what he just saw was the glorified vision of Jesus. So John writes that down, chapter 1. Then he says, write the things which are... We're told in verse 20 of that chapter, chapter 1, the things which are, are the seven churches. And so chapters 2 and 3 are the things which are. Present tense, dealing with the church from Pentecost, when the church was born, to the rapture. And then the last thing he says there, Michelle, you took it down too quick. There it is. And the things which will take place after this. Future tense. And that's how chapter 4, verse 1 starts. It tells us, And these after these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, and I believe this is where the rapture takes place in the book of Revelation, Come up here, and I'll show you things which must take place after this. So the same thing Jesus says in uh, chapter 1, 19, after these things, he says here, after these things, it's metatauta. And so after the church age is finished, the church is removed, then everything from chapters 4 through 19, you know, is from heaven. We're looking down on what's happening down here on earth during the great tribulation time. We saw that in chapters 4 and 5, John is in heaven around the very throne room of God. He's blown away by all the sights and sounds. Uh, he's witnessing the cherubim, uh, the angels of God. He sees the church around the throne of God, and everybody's worshiping the Lord. Then in chapter 5, the scene intensifies as a mighty angel proclaims with a booming voice, Who is worthy to take the scroll and to unloose the seals? That scroll, I believe, is a title deed to planet Earth. And it says nobody in heaven or on earth was uh, worthy to take the scroll. And it says John begins to weep. He's, he's sobbing because he's thinking, oh no, Satan is going to be in control of this world forever. Nobody can take this scroll and reclaim you know, this world back to the Lord until he sees Jesus as a lamb, and though he'd been slain. And then once the Lord takes the scroll out of the Father's right hand, all of heaven erupts. They worship the Lord because they know, of course, the lamb, he alone is worthy to take that scroll and to loose its seals. Now, why do I say Satan has that scroll right now? Why he's the God of this world right now? Because this is what we find in Luke chapter 4, verses 5 through 7. This is when Jesus is being tempted by the devil. And this is before he starts his earthly ministry. And the second temptation says, Then the devil taking him, Jesus, up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, and the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. So Satan, when Adam and Eve sinned, because God gave them authority over all the world, you know, dominion over everything, and then they sin. It's like they forfeited that title deed to Satan, who's the god of this world, the prince of the power of the air. But it's here that Jesus reclaims this once and for all back to the Father. So Jesus did not dispute Satan's claim that all this authority, this ownership of the world belonged to Satan. But obviously Jesus wasn't going to bow down. He's not going to worship Satan. So, you know, he'll tell him, Get behind me, Satan, for you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve so that brings us to chapter 6 in Revelation where we see Jesus taking the title deed and it's got seven seals on that scroll. And every time the Lord peels off a seal, 
that's when the judgments begin. The first thing that happens, the Antichrist shows up in chapter 6, and then you've got, you know, death, you've got wars, you've got famines, you've got all pestilences, and then there's the saints under the altar crying out, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you avenge our blood on those on the earth? And then when he opens the seven seals, not the end. That just brings on the seven trumpet judgments. And each time these, there's three sets of judgments. Each time there's another set, things get worse. Things intensify. So chapter 16 is the final three judgments of God. And it's going to be brutal beyond our comprehension. You don't want, again, your worst enemy to be here when this happens. So... When we get to chapter 19, we'll see how these days will be shortened by the literal, visible return of Jesus Christ from heaven to earth, and all the saints clothed in fine linen, bright and clean, will be following the Lord, riding on white horses. Well, that's you and me. So we're going to go up to be with the Lord at the rapture. We come back with the Lord at the second coming. In between that 70th week of Daniel, God is dealing with the Jewish people, but also judging those on this earth. So that's a quick synopsis of what's happening here. But let's start in chapter 15, verse 1. This is the, the finale of God's wrath and judgment being poured out upon this Christ-rejecting world. It says, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. And those who have the victory over the beast, that's the Antichrist, over his image and over his mark, remember the 666, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. So this is actually a very beautiful scene where we see these tribulation saints they're going to be put to death for their faith and trust in the Lord. And they refused to worship the Antichrist. They rejected the mark of the beast. They turned to Christ for salvation. And again, notice it says they have victory over the beasts. Only those who reject the Antichrist will have victory over the Antichrist. It's going to cost them their lives. Now, we saw the first wave of what are known as tribulation saints. We saw them back in chapter 6. And what do we see there in chapter 6, verses 10 through 11? Look on the screen. It says, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. And so here we see it is completed. And so there we saw them standing on a sea of glass and uh, like, like crystal in chapter 4. Here it says the sea of glass is mingled with fire because God's divine judgment is about to be poured out. So they have victory. And because they have victory, we see they, they're going to sing a song, the tribulation saints. That's what verses 3 and 4 are. It says they sing the song of Moses the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Well, Jesus is the King of kings. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested." So they sing this one song, but it has two titles, the Song of Moses, which is found in Exodus 15. That's when the Jews are escaping from Pharaoh's army. They get to the Red Sea. They're boxed in. Uh, God tells Moses, stretch out your staff over the waters, and then God parts the waters of the Red Sea. All the Israelites, a million and a half or so, cross on dry land through the Red Sea. They're getting to the other side, and then it says God brings the waters upon the Egyptian army, Pharaoh's army, and they all drown. I think that is the Red Sea, a deep part of the Red Sea. It's amazing because there'll be skeptics say, oh no, they couldn't have done that. They crossed over on the Sea of Reeds, which is north. It's like six inches of water. Really? What's the greater miracle, that they made it on six inches of water or they, they, all the Pharaoh's army drowned in six inches of water? It <laughs> makes no sense. 
So God's part of the Red Sea. He brings it on them. They all drown. And when they get to the other side, you can read about it. It's Exodus 15. They're singing this song. They call it the Song of Moses. Miriam, after they finish, she sings the same song you know, with tambourines and everything. And uh, the horse and the rider will be cast, cast into the sea. We used to sing that song. It's pretty cool. Anyway, the Song of the Lamb, that's acknowledging that there's a greater enemy than Pharaoh. The greatest enemy of all is sin. And Jesus, the Lamb of God, takes away the sin of the world. So the Song of Moses, they're delivered from the things of this world. The Song of the Lamb is that we're delivered from the worst enemy of all, our sin. So a beautiful psalm that ties the Old Testament and the New Testament together. John 1.17 says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Verse 5, After these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. So say that five times fast. God told Moses to build the tabernacle, you know, in the wilderness there. They build the tabernacle, and it was a model of what we're reading here. I mean, God dwells in the tabernacle, the, you know, the holy of holies in glory. Mo Moses built a model of that. And so when we get to chapters 21 and 22, those chapters go into great detail about God's heavenly sanctuary, New Jerusalem. It's a big giant cube, 1,500 miles in each direction. The Holy of Holies was 15 cubits in each direction that Moses built in the tabernacle. But be that as it may, we'll read more about that when we get there. Verse 6 says, And out of the temple came the seven angels having the seven plagues clothed in pure bright linen and having their chests girded with golden girdles. And so these guys come directly uh, into and from the heavenly sanctuary. Their clothing is a reminder that God's judgments are always pure and holy and true. Verse 7 says, And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. So these bowls, when it says they're full, it means full to the brim. And this uh, cherubim, remember the four cherubim, they encircle the throne of God and all night and day. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. So one of these cherubim, gives these seven angels, these seven bowls that are filled with the wrath of God. Verse 8, the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And now notice this, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. So an amazing scene here. Uh, it's like the Shekinah glory of God fills the temple here. And it was so thick and heavy that no one could enter the temple until after the seven bowls are poured out. I mean, this declares to every living being in heaven that God's final judgments will be poured out. And nobody's going to be able to stop this. You know, you can't pray for anybody after this. I mean, their fate is sealed. You know, you can't... You know, stop this because God is going to deal at this point with all wickedness and rebellion once and for all. The good news is, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, it's not too late. You can still come to Christ. He still has open arms to receive you as Lord and Savior. You know, he's got the nail-pierced hands, just like Thomas. Come on, Thomas, put your finger here. You know, put your hand on my side. Don't be unbelieving. That's for anybody that's not a believer. Don't be unbelieving. Realize Jesus Christ died for your sins. He paid the price through the shedding of his blood. He alone conquered the grave by rising from the dead, and he's inviting you to come to him for salvation. If you don't, take heed to what we're going to read in chapter 16, because this is what's coming upon this world in the near future. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. This is Jesus telling whoever might be listening, come to me. All you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Heavy laden means you're burdened down with all the junk, the garbage of this world. You're just sick and tired of being sick and tired of living in this fallen world. So he says, come to me, I'll give you rest. John 6, 35. 
Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me, there's the invitation, come to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. Then Jesus says, John 6 verse 40, And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Once again, as we saw last time, there are two sides to every coin. On one side of the coin is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. He came as gentle, meek. He, was allowed, he allowed himself to be beaten and tortured and slaughtered on the cross, shedding his blood for our sins. That's one side of the coin. The other side is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. When he returns at a second coming, he is going to come with vengeance, and he is going to judge, and he's going to you know, take out his wrath upon those who have rejected him, those who have blasphemed his name. So it's not a flip of the coin that determines your eternal fate and destiny. This is what I believe about it. God is sovereign, and in his sovereignty, he has created you with a free will. He never forces anybody to believe in him and receive him as Lord and Savior. A day is coming when everyone will bow before him and acknowledge he is Lord, but then it's too late. That's at the great white throne judgment. Right now, he's given you a free will to believe in him, to trust him. That's why he says, come to me. If you don't, he's not going to twist your arm. He's not going to put a gun to your head and says, you're going to believe in me or else. No, he comes as a lion or as the lamb who loves you, who paid the price for you. That's a simple reason why Jesus tells us in John 3, 16 and 17, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, that means be destroyed, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. That's not why he came 2,000 years ago. He didn't come to condemn us, but that the world through him might be saved. So here in verse 8, no one is allowed to go into this temple, the temple of God in heaven, but God himself. All wickedness, all rebellion will be dealt with once and for all. So look at chapter 16, verse 1. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. Interesting, because no one's in the temple but God. So who is this? Well, I think this is Jesus. You know, all authority has been given to Jesus. All judgment has been given to Jesus. This is what we're told in John chapter 5, verse 22. For the Father judges no one, but, his, but has committed all judgment to the Son. And so now we have the final, quickly, I believe this is going to take place, outpouring of God's wrath. Verse 2. Isn't this a happy, happy, joy, joy message? Well, I can't wait till we get to chapter 19. I mean, that's when it gets, well, it's all good. It's God's word, but that's when it gets, from our perspective, much better. The second coming of Christ. But here it says, so the first went out. So the first angel with his full bowl went out and poured out his bowl upon the earth in a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. And so this uh, foul, loathsome sore, it's been described as boils, like this will bring boils upon all those who worship the Antichrist, who've taken the mark of the beast. Now, remember in the fifth trumpet judgment that was sounded back in chapter 9, it says demons were let loose and they were allowed to torment everybody on planet earth for five months. They stung them. People could not die. The only ones that were protected were the 144,000 Jewish men, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. Everybody else was fair game, a brutal time. But here, all who have the mark of the beast are singled out with these painful sores, these boils or whatever it might be. Verse 3. Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, 
and it became blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. Can you imagine? Again, when we look at the second trumpet judgment, it says one-third of all the creatures in the sea died, and that's when God's starting to put the pressure on the people on the earth, trying to get them to repent, trying to get them to wake up and realize the Antichrist isn't the Messiah, He's a liar. He's a deceiver. You need to turn to Jesus Christ. So he starts with a third. Now it says all, every creature dies in the seas. Can you imagine the stench? I mean, I, I grew up in San Diego and, there's, and I was a surfer and there's times you get a red tide and you get stuff washing up on the beach. It would smell. But can you imagine every living creature in the seas? All the plankton, all the you know things on the bottom of the ocean, all the fish. You know, seals, all the mammals, you know, the porpoise, whales, all the sharks, everything dying, washing up on the beach, waves of red just crashing on the shoreline. Brutal. I mean, I can't imagine how yucky this is going to be. At the same time, about 70 to 75 percent of all our oxygen comes from plankton in the oceans. And that's all dead now at this judgment. So it's going to get very, very heavy very quickly. Verse 4. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, so all the fresh water supply, and they became blood. Again, the third trumpet judgment, a third of all the fresh water supplies was, was destroyed. Now all the fresh water supplies are destroyed throughout the world. Um, why would God do this? Why would God turn all the fresh water supplies into blood? Well, look at verse 5. Here's the answer. John writes, And I heard the angel of the waters saying, the one who just poured this out, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, speaking of the tribulation saints, they'd already put to death, you know, the prophets of God there in chapter 11, Moses and Elijah, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. And I heard another from the altar saying, even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Again, notice in verse 6, the blood of saints and prophets have been shed by these wicked people at this time. And so it's only fitting. They delight in shedding blood. So God says, okay, I'll give you blood to drink since you love blood so much. How brutal is this? One commentator said, those who refuse to drink the rivers of living water now will eventually have to drink from the waters of death. Notice again, all of us in heaven at this time will understand perfectly well that God's judgments are true. They are righteous. He doesn't apologize for his judgments. You know, sometimes we think, well, God, that's not fair. No, his judgments are perfect. His judgments are totally fair, totally righteous, God has been very long-suffering or patient with men and women at this point, but God's word is crystal clear. He will judge sinners, but he will also reward his saints. Look at verse 8. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and they blaspheme the name of God, who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give glory and give him glory. Uh, again, remember the fourth trumpet judgment, it says a third of the sun uh, gave off a third of its light. So there's quickly global cooling at that point, third less energy hitting the earth. So things quickly deteriorate. And, you know, as you know, most people today, unfortunately, believe the biggest threat to our planet is climate change, specifically man-caused global warming. 
This is not man-caused global warming when God heats up the sun with this plague and everyone is being scorched. This is a judgment from God. This has nothing to do with anything man can do to change the climate. We can't. You know, I've taught for 30 years now uh, that God has already, you know, blessed us. He's always wanted us to be good stewards over planet Earth, which means be good stewards. He's given this to us. He gave it to Adam and Eve. Be, have dominion over these things. He never said, okay, now trash everything I've done for you. That's one extreme. The other extreme is, oh, no, no, worship Mother Earth. That's the extreme we're seeing in the world today. Worship Mother Earth, Gaia. No, no, worship Father God, because Father God will destroy this planet. And we can't stop it. You know, we're spending trillions of dollars every year trying to change the climate. Are you kidding me? God, in one judgment, is going to toast this world. You know, remember in Revelation eleven eighteen, 18, it says, God will destroy those who destroy the earth. But the Green New Deal, they don't acknowledge the Lord God Almighty is the creator of heavens and the earth. Most people behind all the environmental stuff going on are anti-God or they're atheists. And they think this is our only hope. Planet Earth, we have to protect it. We have to save Mother Earth. No, no, we got to start worshiping Father God. God's going to destroy this place with fervent heat. In fact, Jesus, if he didn't come back at the end of these seven years, all of this world would be annihilated. Remember what Jesus says in Matthew 24, 22, unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. How is it shortened? Well, the second coming of Christ. He's going to come back. He is going to establish his kingdom on earth. It's going to last for 1,000 years. We'll be ruling and reigning with him. But during that 1,000 years, he's going to turn this world into a Garden of Eden-like state condition for 1,000 years. Awesome. Amazing. But then you know what he does after the 1,000 years? He vaporizes the entire universe, including planet Earth. Totally, it's going to be gone. You can read about it in 2 Peter 3, 10 through 13. It's going to be melting with fervent heat. He's going to dissolve all the elements in the universe. He's going to roll it up like a scroll. It'll be zilch, nothing. The only thing will be a great white throne. And then he'll raise up all those who have rejected God over the years, and they'll be sentenced to the lake of fire. But then you know what God does? He creates an entirely new heaven and earth. Not heaven like where we're going to be, the universe, the stars. He's going to make it brand new. I mean, you can read about that. Uh, we'll see it in chapter 21, verse 1. He creates a new heaven and a new earth. The word create is create something out of nothing. Just like Genesis 1, God created, bara, the heavens and the earth. He created it out of nothing. He's going to do that again. And we get to watch him do it. It's going to be amazing. And it's going to be forever that new heaven and earth. That is going to be glorious. But that's our hope, not in this planet that is going quickly down the tubes. Jesus tells us in Matthew 24, 35, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So when I say, oh yeah, we're planning on going back to Israel March of 2025. I've had people say, oh, sign me up. I don't even know if we're going to be around in 2025. I hope the rapture comes before then, but we'll plan it. And that's how we're to live our lives. Pastor Chuck used to always say, hey, live each day as if the rapture could happen today, but plan your life as if you got the rest of your life to live. We don't know the day or the hour. So just live for the Lord. He'll take care of when the rapture takes place. But who knows what's going to be like. I mean, Israel was great this time, but there's always rumors. Netanyahu knows they're very, very close to having to do something with Iran. Because Iran has already promised we're so close to having a nuclear weapon, and they're very clear about what they want to do with their nuclear weapons, annihilate Israel, drive the Jews out. I mean, that's their whole plan. So it's like if you're in Israel, which is as wide as from here to um, Delta, from here to Delta, that's how wide Israel is. How long is Israel? From the very tip to the very south, north, south, from here to Denver. That's the nation of Israel. Tiny. You look on a map, you can barely see it with all the Arab nations around it, Muslims that say we're going to destroy them, 
We're going to push them into the Mediterranean Sea. So Israel's on high alert, always. Pray for the peace of Israel, or the peace of Jerusalem. I don't know where I was going with that, but Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So when this fourth bold judgment is poured out on this planet, God will prove how utterly weak and insignificant all of mankind's efforts are pertaining to climate change and saving Mother Earth. When this bowl is poured out, the sun is going to heat up with great intensity. There's going to be radiation, waves of radiation coming down upon this planet. And it's going to be scorching people, it says, with solar heat. People will be crying out, not to the Lord, but they'll be shaking their fist at God. They'll be blaspheming His name. Look again, verse 9. When they're being scorched, they blaspheme. That means they're cursing the name of God. They refuse to repent. They don't turn to the Lord. They shake their fist at God. In other words, even at this time, they refuse to acknowledge Him as the Creator and the Sustainer of life. I told you this wasn't a happy, joy, joy message, but this is what we have before us here. Verse 10. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. Again, they got boils. It's dark. They're being scorched. They nod their tongues because of the pain. They blaspheme the God of heaven. By now you would think they'd be saying, Uncle, we give up because of their pains and their sores and did not repent of their deeds. This is one of the saddest verses there is. And this is an interesting judgment here because it's almost like God gives them a taste of hell. Everything becomes dark. You know, it happened when God brought the plagues upon Egypt. Everything got very, very dark. Here it's very dark. When Jesus died on the cross, taking the wrath that we deserve upon himself, it says the sky turned dark. But here it's like hell because they're gnawing in pain. Everything's dark. You know, Matthew 25, 30, Jesus says, And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Three times in Mark's gospel, Jesus says, Their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Most of you know hell was created for Satan and the fallen angels, the demons. The angels that rebelled with Lucifer and went against God, God created hell for them. But unfortunately, those who reject God will end up in hell with them, the lake of fire. Contrary to popular popular belief hell is not a place where you're going to go and party i'm going to party with all my friends in hell no you won't you're going to be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth and even though there's going to be billions of people in hell millions i don't know how many maybe billions of angel demons in hell you're going to feel all alone isolated even though it's packed but you'll be screaming out in pain total darkness and isolation and torment this is why we don't want to see people go there. This should motivate us to get the gospel out there to as many people as possible. Verse 12, Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. So the great river Euphrates, it's 1,800 miles long. It's always been the natural border between Asia and Europe. And some of you have seen recently, like last summer, there's parts of the Euphrates that are almost dry now, but it's because Turkey and other countries upstream have been putting up these big dams. But at this time, there's going to be three and a half years of drought during the Great Tribulation. The headwaters for the Euphrates River, you know where it is? The mountains of Ararat. What happened to the mountains of Ararat? After the flood, when the flood waters covered the whole earth, and the ark, Noah's ark, came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. And here, it's going to be dried up. The snow is going to be melt, melted off. Maybe God will reveal the ark <laughs> at that time. This is the spot. This is it. Either way, what's going to happen is God is showing the mankind, I've judged this world before, and I'm judging it now. 
This is what Peter says, and he prophesies in 2 Peter 3. Look at these verses, starting in verse 1. This is for all of us today. Beloved, I now write to you the second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, speaking of the Old Testament, and of the commandment of us, the apostles, of the Lord and Savior, speaking of the New Testament. Knowing this first, the scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. So they have the mindset, no, even theistic evolutionists, they believe, oh yeah, God created everything billions of years ago, then he just kind of went away, and then we have evolution. That's theistic evolution. God started it, but he just let it go. That's not what he's saying. God created everything, put man and woman, Adam and Eve, on this planet. There was no death until Adam and Eve sinned. And then death entered about 6,000 years ago. Not millions and millions and millions before because you don't have anything dying until there's sin. Sin brings corruption. Sin leads to death. Paul's very clear about that. So be that as it may, he goes on to say, For they willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. So Peter's reminding us there was a worldwide flood in the days of Noah. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, God's word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. That's what we're seeing here in Revelation. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack or slow concerning his promise, as some count slackness or slowness, but is long-suffering toward us. He's patient toward us. Here's God's heart, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The only reason God's being so patient is he wants people to turn to him. The only reason the rapture hasn't happened yet is because he wants to see more people get saved and come into the kingdom of God, be part of the bride of Christ, and then he'll take us out when the last person gets saved. That's part of the body of Christ. So be that as it may, Jesus is coming back, and we'll see the details there in chapter 19. Now, the great river Euphrates. Can you imagine... That being dried up, it brings all the armies from China, India, from the east, it says, into a specific place. And we were just there in a specific place in Israel. It's called Armageddon, or the Valley of Megiddo. We're standing there on the hill of Megiddo, looking over the Valley of Megiddo. And this is what we read. Look at verse 13 here. And I saw three unclean spirits. So John the Apostle sees these three unclean spirits, these demons like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, that's Satan, out of the mouth of the beast, that's the Antichrist, out of the mouth of the false prophet, that's his right-hand man. For they are spirits of demons performing signs, so these are lying signs and wonders, which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming, this is Jesus inserting this, I am coming as a thief, blessed is, uh, blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Verse 16, And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. The only place in the Bible where that word is mentioned, Armageddon. It's described in many places throughout the Bible. It's the final battlefield where all the armies of the earth are going to gather there in this valley, and it's going to be a giant wine press. Remember what we saw in chapter 14? God brings them there. It's like a giant wine press, but instead of grapes being squished and squashed, it's humans. Remember at the end of chapter 14, it says the blood will flow from there for 1,600 furlongs, about 184 miles. It'll pool up in some areas, it says, to the horse's bridle. That's the last verse in chapter 14. He will destroy millions of people 
at this time. It's going to be brutal. Satan is bringing them all there. And notice how he sees three demons like frogs out of the unholy trinity. The, the Valley of Megiddo is about 50 miles north of Jerusalem. There's been about 17 conflicts there over the years. I think it was Napoleon said, this is the perfect place for a battle. Little did he realize this is the final place for World War III at this time. When it looks like all these armies of the world are going to finish off the Jews, because ultimately that's what they want to do is destroy Israel, Jesus is going to come back in power and great glory. And when he returns, if you look at the chronology, when Jesus comes at a second coming, we come back with him. He first goes to Basra. Basra is near Petra. And in, in uh, Isaiah 16, 4, it says, where do you get all these bloodstains on you? Well, I've been fighting against my enemies. So he goes from Basra up to Megiddo, where the Valley of Armageddon is. They're all fighting each other. They're going to turn their attention on Jesus, and he is going to destroy them. Then Jesus goes from there to the Mount of Olives, and he puts his feet on the Mount of Olives. It splits in two, and then he goes through the Golden Gate, the Eastern Gate, and he'll go on the Temple Mount, and that's when he begins his millennial reign, his 1,000-year reign. Now, this is just going to be an amazing time. When you look at this, you realize the battle is won by Jesus. No matter how dark, how discouraged you get in this world, no matter how horrible things look in the near future, and things are going to implode, I think, pretty quickly, economically, spiritually, we're going down the tubes as a nation and the world, but things are coming very rapidly down the pike, and I think it's just reminding us that our hope is not in this world. Our hope has to be in Jesus. And as we'll see as we go through the rest of this you know, book of Revelation, Jesus wins. We will be with him in glory. We will be with him forever. So hang in there with the Lord. Don't give up. The battle belongs to the Lord, and he is the ultimate victor. So look at verse 17, the final bowl. And the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. We'll see a little bit more what this bowl does, but i got to stop here because John Corson has a great quote about this verse here. And I love what he says. It says, Two mountains come to mind. Both deal with the wrath of God as he pours out his wrath on men at Megiddo and upon his son at Calvary. Both are blood baths as blood flows to the horse's manes at Megiddo and from the son's veins at Calvary. Both are completions. As it is done, cries a voice from heaven at Mount Megiddo. While it is finished, cries a voice from Mount Calvary. Will you endure the final wrath of the father at Megiddo, or will you embrace the finished work of the Son on Calvary. The choice is yours. End quote. So true. Look at verse 18. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And that's what chapter 17 and 18 are all about. Kind of more insights into this one verse. Then, verse 20, every island fled away because of this great earthquake, and the mountains were not found. This will be the biggest earthquake this world has ever experienced. In fact, there's three earthquakes mentioned in the book of Revelation, and again, they all get stronger and stronger. Here, can you imagine every fault line, San Andreas Fault through California, every fault line, Turkey, they've been experiencing these things. Around the Pacific Rim, the Rim of Fire, there's fault lines all over the world. When this judgment happens, every fault line is going to be split, it's going to shake, it's going to make everything in this world crumble. This is why Jesus says, unless those days are shortened, no flesh should be saved. It's going to be brutal beyond our comprehension. 
Islands, it says, will disappear. Mountains will be leveled. Every building will be, you know, crushed. And great Babylon will face the ultimate fury, it says, of God's wrath. Finally, <laughs> we're almost done. Verse 21, this is all part of the final seventh bowl. And great hail from heaven fell upon men. This, now, this is not a little hail star, storm like we get here. Each hailstone about the weight of a talent. A talent in biblical days was between 75 and 100 pounds. So just picture probably the size of this podium, hailstones, dropping all over these people at the Valley of Megiddo, Armageddon, just coming down upon them. And as these things are falling, it says, Men blaspheme God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. Once again, I see this is the, the reason why there's going to be blood flowing for 184 miles through Israel. You've got all the blood from destruction at the Valley of Megiddo because of World War III, Armageddon. And then you got these hailstones falling, 100 pounds of ice dropping on everybody. The sun is heated up, scorching everybody, so the water quickly, the ice quickly melts. And so then you've got this river of blood flowing out of the valley of Megiddo. Once again, men blaspheme God because of his righteous judgment. They shake their fist at God and curse his holy name. And unfortunately, we've seen this throughout the book of Revelation. Instead of repenting and turning to Jesus and calling out to God for forgiveness, they continue to just curse God. They harden their hearts towards him. But this is why, you know, the Apostle Paul says in Romans 2, 4, don't you realize it's the kindness of God that leads a man to repentance? Or the goodness of God is what leads us to repentance? He's kind. He's good. He loves you. He allows things into our lives because he just wants to draw us closer to him. But it's all because he loves us. Don't ever try to separate God's sovereignty from his love. He loves you. He paid the price to redeem your life, and it was through his son Jesus. That's how much he loves us. God demonstrated his own love toward us. And while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But if you reject him, you reject his love, don't you realize it's his kindness that will lead you to repentance? His judgment, as we see here, drives people into further hatred towards God. It's so sad. Many people are going to get saved during the Great Tribulation. Make no mistake about it. But now is the time to turn to the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, who is slaughtered for you, so you would not have to be slaughtered by God. You won't have to face His wrath, because on the cross, Jesus took all of the wrath we deserve upon Himself. When He cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? <sighs> Now he says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you because he was forsaken in your place. So if you come to Jesus, he loves you. You're safe and secure in his hands. No one can snatch you out of the Father's hand. No one can snatch you out of Jesus' hand. But if you reject him, man, I don't want to be in your sandals when you stand before the Lord. You don't want to face the lion of the tribe of Judah. Turn to the lamb today. What's up? Who's with you? Some homeless people. Oh, yeah? It's my parents. Oh. <laughs>